Be in the house of the Lord one more time. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. We're just so, so grateful that he allowed us to, to wake up this morning. And then he closed us in our right mind, giving us a reasonable portion of our health and our strength so we could press our way out one more time to the church. Amen. And for those who are watching us virtually as we call to worship this morning, Psalms, the Lord is my light and my strength. Whom shall I feel? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? As we come together, we call to worship this morning, this service at Big Rock Center Missionary Baptist Church. Why well, I'm one of the sons in the ministry, Reverend Hodrick Robinson. Amen. 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 And, and in the absence of our pastor, Pastor Henry C. Davis Jr., we, we thank all of you all who are joining us virtually this morning. We thank you all who are here. Amen. That you tune in to, to fellowship with us as we pray for him as he's visiting this morning at Shiloh Baptist Church on Kramer Avenue. And we have with us, their pastor, amen. amen. Pastor Taurus Fuller, the pastor of Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church on Kramer Avenue. And at this time, we will have our, a review of our Sunday school lesson by Minister Ernestine Womack. And following Minister Ernestine, Ernestine Womack, we will have two selections from the choir. And at that time, you will receive Pastor Taurus Fuller from Shiloh Missionary Baptist Church, Kramer Avenue. Amen. Amen. Good morning, virtual world. Good morning, Big Rock Santa. We thank God that in the absence of our pastor, he has left the house in order. Our Sunday school lesson is about Priscilla called to ministry, to minister. We are speaking on individuals who have had to come together to grow ministry, that the house of God will increase. This morning, we find that Paul has left Athens, and he's come to Corinth, where he meets Aquila and his wife Priscilla. And in this place, we're going to just go through the four points that the pastor has left today. They have to remind me because I always keep on my mask. We're going to go through just the four, four points, and then we're going to turn it over to the worship, praise and worship team. To begin with the first point, ministry needs dependable people. Amen. So here we find Paul, who has met a, a couple, Aquila and Priscilla, and we, when he arrives, he finds these people who are people alike him. He found out that they're tent makers, and he began to join hands with them, and, and they took on the task of doing the tent, being tent makers, and that began to cause a relationship. They became close, and Paul had an opportunity to teach and mentor them in the Word of God. So this became a relationship. And how many of us know that it's very crucial that we start with a relationship, oh, yeah. even with God? That's, just, that's how we grow, and that's how we become in a group of unity. Then the second point says faithful, faithfulness would expand ministry. It causes a good models for Christianity. Faithfulness. You can't be wavering in your walk with Christ. If you come to be, in, be a ministry, you have got to be a steadfast, unmovable, always abiding in the works of the Lord. 
People won't become attached to what they see if you're over here one minute and you're over here the next minute. And you're still trying to give them the word and tell them about the goodness of Jesus, but you're not living it. You got to be faithful unto death. That's what the word says. In order for people to join in with you, if you're a Christian and you're teaching the word of God, if you're teaching people about how to become a part of God, you got to make sure that they have a relationship with you. So that means you got to show love. To beget love. Yeah, yeah. To cause people to want to be a part of whatever you are. Yeah. It's crucial because God loved us first. Yeah, yeah. So whatever we teach him, we make sure we're coming from the word of God and not from ourselves. All right. God will tend to us if we cause people to error. All right. But when we do the work of ministry, we feed them the word of God. Amen. Amen. And they become a part of it. And then that caused them to be faithful. See, that's, and I'm going to leave this alone, but that's what I say about positions being held in the church. You can't be wavering in, in your ministry. In order for your ministry to grow, you have got to be faithful. You got to work and allow people to see you doing the work, and then they'll become a part of that because they see the realness in you and what you're doing for the body of Christ. The next one says mentorship. Is vital for these who want it to be effective in ministry. Mentorship. Paul was with them for about three years in Ephesus as their mentor. Paul taught them in Corinth. He taught them all about the work of ministry. Paul taught Priscilla and Aquila, and then they taught Apollos. So you see how ministry is growing because of what they're seeing going on. The teaching must be effective. It must cause people to come to Christ, cause people to desire what you're doing in ministry, cause people to know that God is real, and that whatever he sets me to, I must stay on the battlefield. Yes. That people may become more enlightened about God and then be want him more. Yeah. It causes a comfort with them, with their own experiences with Christ. And therefore, they were greatly appreciated. An apostle in the work of the Lord must also stay Focus and do what it is that God has called them to do. Amen. That the people may be drawn. How many know that Paul is a good mentor? Yes, Lord. He taught the word. Yes, Lord. Now you know Paul was a devout murderer. <laughs> and when he came, became to know the Lord, he became a devout Christian. Yes, drawing the body into Christ. Yes. Teaching them about the goodness of Jesus. For them to know who God is. Yes. So that they will understand that as I was a man who didn't understand the word of God. Uh -huh. Being taught the will of God caused me to become a devout Christian. Amen. I had to go through something. That's what Paul said. Yeah. Yes. Let me leave this alone because I want to preach it. And my last one says good ministry leaders need to be com committed follower workers, and fellow workers. This couple assisted Paul in spreading the gospel and prompting the kingdom of lordship of Christ. They helped encourage young converts and comfort them with their own experiences. Here we must be committed as I close. Fellow workers. I can't say I love my brother or my sister and then I turn around and mistreat them. We may be able to fool the world, but we can't fool God. This study today is about people being faithful. And as I studied, I 
understood that husband and wives are two of the greatest people in ministry to do the work together. It causes the relationship to grow. It causes other people to see what God is doing in your life. It causes people to understand that your faithfulness causes you to want to be a part of something. We need to remember Priscilla and Aquila. We need to understand that their ministry was faithfulness. And it grew from there. There were others who became a part of all of this because of what Paul taught to them. And they were faithful to the ministry and others they taught. I thank my pastor this morning for allowing me to do the view, the review. And now we're going to turn it over to our praise team for worship. Join in with us. Give the Lord a praise. Hallelujah.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father, Big Rock Zana Church family, for this is the day that the Lord has made. And let us all rejoice and be glad in it. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. The fact that you have breath in your body, you ought to give God praise, glory, and honor because he didn't have to wake us up this morning. But the fact that we have breath in our body... God deserves the praise. God deserves the glory. God deserves the honor. Don't think that it was you that woke yourself up. If it had not been for the Lord that was on your side, where would you be? Where would you be? Where would you be if it was not for his grace and his mercy? He looked beyond all of our faults and he still supplied all of our needs. Good morning, Big Rock Center Church family. I am excited for this opportunity to proclaim the unsearchable riches of Jesus the Christ. I'm grateful for the opportunity from your pastor, my brother in Christ, Pastor Henry C. Davis Jr., for allowing, mis allowing me this opportunity to stand in the pulpit in the church that he shepherds. There is a word from the Lord recorded in the Gospel of John. John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Reading from verses 12 through 14. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. John chapter 15 verses 12 through 14. Hear these words. This is my commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be unto God. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for this preaching moment. As we turn to your word, I ask that you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, hearts that believe, heads that understand, and wills that will obey your word. Speak in this moment that we may bear fruit of your word on this day. 
Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Now, God, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh, Lord, my strength and my redeemer, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I want to, I want to preach from the subject, the power of love. The power of love. The power of love. There is a story about a little boy who wanted to grow so bad that he made a ruler to measure himself by. And each day the little boy would stand beside his ruler and say, I'm getting bigger. One day his father walked into the room and asked him, son, what are you doing? The boy replied that he was measuring himself and watching himself grow. His father looked at his measuring stick and went into another room and returned with a yardstick. The father told his son to stand beside the yardstick and to the boy's disappointment, to the boy's dismay, he had not grown from what the doctor had told him a year ago. The problem the boy had was that he was measuring himself by his own yardstick. Beloved, as believers in the body of Christ, we suffer, we endure with the very same problem. We measure our sense of Christianity by our very own yardstick. We puff out our chest and we pat ourselves on the back. But God views all of us that we are no more than just filthy rags. And the text that was read in your hearing, the text challenges us to respond to the command of Jesus Christ in order to display and demonstrate a greater love. Brothers and sisters, I need you to understand that biblical love involves more than, simply, more than simple emotions. Biblical love involves more than personal preferences. Love is driven by sacrifice for the well-being of others. Let me say it again. Love is driven by the sacrifice for the well-being of others. So when it comes to this word called love, this word is often used carelessly. This word love is often used casually. And if you don't believe me, listen to yourself closely when you talk about or describe certain things because we love to say that we love a lot of things. Perhaps you may say that you love a certain sports team. Maybe you may say that you love patronizing or supporting a particular restaurant. Possibly you may say that you love traveling. Perhaps you may say that you love your house or your car. Maybe you may say that you love music. Maybe you may say that you love poetry or artwork. Perhaps you may say that you love fishing, golfing, or gardening. Maybe you may say that you love watching a certain television show, but a good definition of the word love is found in 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, which says, God is love. Simply meaning, when we think about this word love, we need to start with God. Because God is the one who created love. And since God is the one who created love, we must follow God's example because God's example is our standard as well as our model. But even in the midst of all of our struggles, even in the midst of all of our trials and tribulations, Jesus not only reminds us of his importance when it comes to love, but he also instructs us on how to be centered in love. Because in John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11, Jesus makes it clear that he is the true vine and that the followers are the branches. But when Jesus gets down to verse 12, he's letting us know about the relationship we should have with one another. But even though songs, even though books, even though poetry, movies, and television shows have often been written about love, Jesus is pointing out to us that if you profess to be a believer, if you profess to be a Christian, if you you profess to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. You must learn how to love like Jesus loves. 
Beloved, I want you to understand that Jesus never said loving people would be easy. No, no, he never said loving people would be easy. But in order to display evidence to this dark and decaying world that you are the salt of the earth, that you are the light of the world, according to Matthew chapter 5, we have to demonstrate love to one another even when we don't feel like it. But keep in mind, Jesus is nearing the end of his earthly ministry, and his disciples have been with him for three years. They have witnessed Jesus cast out demons. They have witnessed Jesus heal the sick. They have witnessed Jesus give sight to the blind, and they have witnessed Jesus empower the lame to walk. They have been with Jesus when he calmed the raging sea by saying, peace, be still. They have been with Jesus when he fed 5,000 men, not including women and children, with two pieces of catfish and five buttermilk biscuits. Jesus had taught the disciples many things about God. He taught them about life. He taught them about the world, and he taught them about themselves. And now Jesus sums up his ministry. He sums up his teaching with one word, and that word is love. So in the text, Jesus gives his disciples some instructions that he expects them to follow. But guess what? Those instructions apply to you and I as well. Us meaning those that have been saved. Us meaning those that are born again. Us meaning those that have been redeemed by the hand of God. Those us meaning those that have been snatched from the hand of the enemy. So Jesus is saying, if you're going to be his disciple, first and foremost, you have a responsibility to love. That's my first point. You have a responsibility to to love. Yes, I realize that all of us have responsibilities, but if you profess to be a Christian, if you profess to be a believer, there is one major responsibility that Jesus expects for us to carry out and to follow because verse 12 says, this is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Remember now, Jesus is talking to believers in this discourse. In other words, as a believer, we have a responsibility to love one another in the same way Christ has loved us. And I realize that it can be difficult to love some people. However, we still have a responsibility to love folk even if they are not lovable. Let me say it again. As believers in the body of Christ, we still have a responsibility to love one another even if they are not lovable. And to love as Christ loved us is putting it on a very high level. And I want you to understand that if you reject the responsibility to love one another in the same way that Christ has loved us, then you are deliberately and intentionally disobeying and violating the word of God. Keep in mind, all of us have enemies. Oh, yes. All of us have enemies. Your enemies could be in your household. They could be your family members. They could be your friends. They could be your neighbors. They could be your co-workers. Your enemies can even be somebody within the church. All of us have enemies, but Jesus never told us to like our enemies. Jesus told us to love our enemies. And the reason why some folk are dealing with certain strongholds in their life is because they're not properly loving people the way Christ desires for us to love them. I realize how fragile love is and how easily it is to be ruined and damaged by hate, prejudice, mistreatment, abuse, judgment, and a lack of forgiveness. Yes, I realize there are times when it is difficult, if not almost impossible, to love because we have been wounded so deeply. But Jesus says, in spite of your pain, in spite of your embarrassment, in spite of your disappointment, in spite of the wrongdoing, as a believer, you have the responsibility to love others in the same way that Jesus has loved us. And Jesus is pointing out that this is not optional. 
This is not an option. Jesus is saying this is not a choice. This is not a suggestion. This is not a recommendation. But Jesus says this is a command. And since it is a command, we have a responsibility to love and do it to the fullest. But beloved, listen to me carefully. You are not responsible for how people treat you. But you are responsible for how you treat somebody else. Let me say that again. You are not responsible for how somebody treats you. But you are responsible for how you treat somebody else. We have to be careful how we treat people because we could be entertaining angels unaware. God has a way of showing up beyond our understanding. God has a way of showing up beyond our comprehension. And he will use people and he will use things to test us. But check this out. Not only do we see the responsibility to love... But secondly, we must prove our love. Yeah, we have a responsibility to love, but secondly, we have to prove our love. Jesus was so adamant about love that he took it a step further. Because verse 13 goes on to say, greater love has no one than this. That one lay down his life for his friends. In other words, in other words, Jesus is saying the greatest way to show your love for your friends is to die for them. Brothers and sisters, we must understand that God created us in his image as well as in his likeness. Therefore, as a believer in the body of Christ, it is God's desire that we learn how to mimic, that we learn how to imitate the characteristics of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in John chapter 14, verse 15, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. In other words, Jesus said, if you love me, then you will prove it. God demonstrated, God proved his love for humanity by sending his son Jesus into the world. Jesus proved and demonstrated the love of God by giving his life as a ransom by dying on the cross for our sins. The death of Jesus led to everlasting life for those that believe in him and that showed and displayed no greater love. Because as an unbeliever, unbeliever, unbeliever meaning before you had a relationship with God, we were sinking we were sinking deep in sin very stained within and sinking to rise no more but the master of the sea heard my despair and cry from the waters lifted me now safe am I because love lifted me and since his love lifted me that means he redeemed me since his love lifted me that means he rescued me since his love lifted me that means he saved me since his love lifted me that means he delivered me since he loved me since his love lifted me that means he set me free and the fact that Jesus laid down his life for you and I proves to us how much he loves us and since Jesus proved to us his agape, unconditional, sacrificial love, we need to prove to him how much we really love him and love others by showing it through our actions. Because the last time I checked, talk is cheap. And if you want to prove that you love God and that you love others, then you must live the life that you talk about. Just don't talk about that you love somebody. Demonstrate it through your actions that you truly love somebody. If you really love somebody, then you will treat them right. If you really love somebody, then you won't be intentional about stabbing them in the back. If you truly love somebody, you will not try to cut somebody down. If you truly love somebody, you will not truly try to discourage and demolish and destroy somebody beloved Jesus is serious about us loving one another as he has loved us because it shows that we know God let me say that again Jesus is serious about us loving one another as he has loved us because it shows that we know God and first John chapter 4 verse 8 says the one 
who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In other words, you can't say that you know God and you refuse to love others. Because when you love others, it is a sign, it is evidence that you know God and that you know him by experience. And if you are a believer in the body of Christ, that means you have had an encounter with Jesus Christ. If you have had an encounter with Jesus Christ, the way that you used to live, you can't live no more. The way you used to talk, you can't talk talk no more. The, some of the places that you used to go, you can't go anymore because there has been a change and a transformation in your life. So I have a question for you. And the question is, does God live in you? Let me say it again. The question is, does God live in you? Only you can answer that question for yourself. But keep in mind, the Bible says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God who he has not seen. Brothers and sisters, I need you to understand that love is a distinctive mark of a believer and love is also the distinctive mark of the body of Christ. So, just in case, just in case I haven't made it clear enough to you, let me clear it up by saying it this way. God demands for you to love others in the same way he loves you. Let me say it again. God demands for you and I to love others in the same way he loves you. So when it comes to the power of love, not only is there a responsibility to love. Not only is, should you prove our love, but third and finally, we see the benefit of love. Yeah. The responsibility to love. Prove our love. Third and finally, the benefit of love. Because verse 14 of John chapter 15 concludes by saying, you are my friends if you do what I command you. I need you to understand that being a Christian is not a hit and miss suggestion. Being a Christian, being a believer, being a disciple of the Lord Jesus requires following his instructions and commands. If you follow the instructions, if you follow the commands of Jesus Christ, guess what? You will bear fruit because the Bible says you will know them by their fruit. And a good tree does not produce bad fruit and a bad tree does not produce good fruit. Beloved, genuine love for others cannot be substituted with money. You cannot put a price tag on love. And I want you to realize that a church can survive without a large budget, but a church cannot survive without love. Let me say that again. A church can survive without a large budget, but a church cannot survive without love. And Jesus wants us to know that he proved his love to us by laying down his life so that we can be a friend of God. He laid down his life so that we can be a friend of God instead of being an enemy of God. And as a believer, Jesus is our friend because he died for us. And as a believer, we are friends when we keep and do his commandments. Let me say it again. As a believer, Jesus is our friend because he died for our sins. And as a believer, we are his friend when we do and keep his commandments. But remember now, a friend loves at all times. So that means you can't call everybody friend because some people will turn on you like the weather. Call one day and hot the next day. But when it comes to Jesus, he'll stick closer than any brother. And since Jesus will stick closer than any brother, you can agree with the hymn writer that says, What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. My brothers and my sisters. When we understand that knowing God is not a, about a ritual, 
and that knowing God is about a relationship, then we're able to comprehend, then we're able to understand that the cross had a vertical beam as well as a horizontal beam. But Jesus dying on the cross demonstrated the unconditional sacrificial love that God had for humanity. His love stretched upward and outward. His love stretched toward heaven as well as humanity. And because of his love, he died so that we may have everlasting life if we would believe in him. And I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that God demonstrated his love and sacrificed his life on the cross because it was at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light and the burden of my heart heart rolled away. It was there by faith. I received my sight and now I am happy all the day. My brothers and my sisters, you ought to be happy that God snatched you from the hand of the enemy. You ought to be happy that God snatched you out of darkness and now you're in the marvelous light. You ought to be happy that you have been redeemed. You ought to be happy that your sins have been forgiven because God demonstrated his sacrificial agape love for you and I. And don't ever think it's because of you. Don't ever think it's because of your education. Don't ever think it's because of your money. If it had not been for the Lord on your side. Where would you be? You ought to thank God for his love. You ought to thank God for his grace. You ought to thank God for his mercy. You ought to thank God that he looked beyond your faults and supplied all of your needs because there is nobody like Jesus. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, God is worthy to be praised. So every moment you get, you ought to bless the name of the Lord. Every moment you get, you ought to worship God in spirit and in truth. The power of love, the power of love requires us as believers in the body of Christ to be intentional about loving God, but not only loving God, but loving others in the same way that Jesus Christ has loved us because it is our responsibility to love. We have to prove our love, but there is a benefit of love. While we were yet sinners, Christ demonstrated his love for us, that he died for us. No one else can claim what Jesus did on the cross. No one else can claim that they were born as a result of a virgin birth. No one can ever claim except Jesus that he laid down his life, but he had the authority to pick it back up again. No one else can say that they blood, that they bled, suffered, and died, and they stayed on the cross even though he had the power to come down from the cross. But he stayed on the cross and bore our sins so that we may have life and have it more abundantly. And the fact that Jesus did what he did we should be grateful and appreciative and we must always understand that Jesus did not save us just to save us but he saved us in order to be a witness to this dark and decaying world so that others would see God in us and glorify God in heaven so if you don't remember anything else just remember that the greatest responsibility as a believer in the body of Christ is not only to love God, but to love others in the same way that Jesus Christ has loved us. God bless you today, Big Roxana Church family. give you glory because of who you are I give you praise because of who you are I will lift my voice and say Because of who you are, oh, oh, Lord, I worship you because of who you are. Glory to God. 
you glory. Our God, hallelujah, you, Jesus. Hey, God. Because of who you are, I give you praise. Because of who you are, I will live my voice and say, Lord, I worship you because of who you are. Lord, I worship you because of who you are. Give you glory, God. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because of who you are, I give you praise. Lord God, yeah, yeah. Because of who you are, I will lift my voice and say, Lord, I worship you. Of who you are. Because of who you are. Lord, I worship you because of who you are. Come on and help, help us say Jehovah. Jehovah, Jehovah. My, 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 my provider. My provider.
of God said amen. amen. People of God said amen. amen. You got a third chance. The people of God said amen. amen. Truly, we've been blessed, Pastor Fuller, by your word, the power of love. You know, it made me think about one of my favorite scriptures, Luke 6, 27 to 28, says, love your enemies. Do good to them that hate you. Bless them that curse you. And pray for them that despitefully use you. The word at the end of each one of those is you. You are responsible, like you said, for how you treat others. You're not responsible for how others treat you. It, that, that, Help me along my way because sometimes it does get a little hard to love people. But if you're going to be like Christ, you got to have some unconditional love. The doors of the church are open. Will there be one that want to know the power of love? Real love. Genuine, unconditional love. It said it covers a multitude of sins. You can come by Christian experience, water baptism, watch care, or by letter. But the main thing is come. The old church said, while the blood is running warm in your vein, because it'll be too late when they roll you in the front of the church. It'll be too late. But you can join us virtually. God knows that you need to join Put your hand in Jesus' hand. The hand of the man that said, peace, be still. And he can give you that same power when you come in contact with him. He said, you would do greater works. And if he said it, I believe it, and that settles it. So, and I don't, I hope I'm not out of order. I want the praise team to sing another song before I give the benediction. Is that all right? Yeah. Right. Give us another selection, then I'll come back and get a benediction. Once again, thank you, Pastor Fuller. We feel the love, and you taught us, hey, we need to love one another. At the end of the day, love. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Let 
rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of our King rise among us. Let it rise. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the glory of the Lord rise among us. Let the praises of our King rise among us. Let it rise. doing the benediction now Robinson let the glory of the Lord hallelujah rise amongst us his people hallelujah in the absence of our pastor pastor Henry C. Davis Jr. I'd like to thank everyone who joined us virtually thank everyone who came out thank the praise team for urging in the spirit thank pastor Fuller and when I heard your last name, I knew you were going to be able to preach with my last name full of two. <laughs> Just kidding. But thank God for the word, man, because we need to know that love is patient. Love is kind. Love is long-suffering. Love is not puffed up. Does keep no record of wrong. If we just learn how to love, it's the key to the kingdom of of heaven. And now unto him who's able to keep us from falling and present us faultless before his badges with, with exceeding great joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty, dominion and power, henceforth, now, and forevermore. And all the people of God said, Amen, Amen, amen and Amen.